Okay, so in this module, uh, we're going to be looking at social sobriety and how we decide who we are and how we're going to interact with the world, what stories we're going to tell. We're going to deal with whatever fears and dread that we have about entering social situations. We're going to practice um, our stories. We're going to look at our identity of who we thought we were as drinkers and who we probably really were, and then contrast that with who we want to be as non-drinkers and how we want to be perceived. Um, and so we're just going to do a lot of reflections, and you can download this, um, this below. But let's get started with the beliefs that are creating the dread and concern of moving into social situations. Um, you know, one thing I hit over and over and over in these modules is the, the very big truth um, that you are responsible for the way you feel. It's not what other people say and do that create your emotions. Your emotions are created by your own thoughts. So to say that somebody made you mad um, is inaccurate. Your thoughts are making you mad um, and perhaps very legit. However, ultimately, it's how you're responding and it's what you're thinking about what's going on. It's how you're perceiving a situation that create the way you feel about it. So um, it's very important to take responsibility for your internal world, your internal perception of stress, your internal perception of acceptance and confidence or fear and dread. Um, the other thing that's important to start out with acknowledging with uh, social situations is that first times are always a little scary, you know, um, and the first time you drove a car, the first time you had sex, the first time you gave a presentation post college or, you know, the first time when you went to college, you know, we do things that we know are good for us and we're excited to do them. But the first time we do them, we're nervous and that's normal and having compassion for yourself um, is very important and understanding that all of this will go away as you get practice, as you navigate situations, some more successful than others, live and learn, move on. So early sobriety is, it's very normal to feel nervous and apprehensive. But, you know, um, the, the urge to protect our privacy, if someone says, you know, are you drinking? Why aren't you drinking? Why did you quit drinking? The urge to protect our privacy really is founded not on necessarily stellar boundaries and self-care, but more or just as much on old fears that are based on old beliefs about drinking and what it means to quit. So we're going to go over the five that I've identified um, of the cultural beliefs that are creating us the most concern. And, you know, the, the magic in this program isn't magic. The magic is simply that you're identifying all the beliefs that are causing problems for you and one by one addressing the underlying thoughts. And then as you think differently, you will feel differently. You have to recognize that you have been brainwashed. We've all been brainwashed. Our culture is brainwashed. And that is analogous to having a software program running in your brain. So every time you experience some anxiety or dread or uncertainty, using that as an opportunity to realize that that old software program has a thought that needs to be deleted is important. And recognizing also that you can't just delete a thought once and it goes away. You know, these are neural pathways. And so if you think about a uh, drip of water, you know, how does a river form? Well, it starts with a little bit of water that moves down, let's say a rock. And the more water that moves down, eventually over millions of years, you know, the river, the path of the river is carved out. And that is what happens in our brain as well. So if, if you're, if we're, you know, close to 50 and 60, then we have very strong developed neural pathways and we have to catch ourselves 
when we begin to enter those neuropathways so that we can redirect into the new neuropathways and the river of sobriety thought patterns is not nearly as deep. We have to continue to reinforce it and it's going to take time, not millions of years, but it's certainly not gonna happen overnight. So recognizing that anything you're feeling is a key that you've got a thought that you're moving down the old beliefs, the old river of alcohol, then that is a great opportunity to learn. So let's dig into the five uh, beliefs and then the underlying thoughts that are creating dread for social situations. The first one um, is that you don't want to admit that alcohol was a problem. You don't want to tell people that. And that's eliciting this strong urge to protect your privacy. Um, and and it's that's a good urge. But ultimately, the underlying belief is that somehow you owe people an explanation as to why you're not drinking. Like, no thank you isn't a complete sentence. Or I'm just not drinking isn't a complete sentence. So we've got this belief that we owe people an explanation. And from our own history as drinkers, when someone says they're not drinking, we've got some assumptions about that. People, because we believe that people don't quit drinking on their own. They quit drinking because, you know, they've got a DUI or some other legal problem, or they're in professional trouble, or their marriage is on the rocks. You know, they've made a bad decision and they were unfaithful. I mean, you know, when we see people who quit drinking, we just assume the worst. And so because we thought that as drinkers, being programmed to think that way, we are tentative that if we say we're not drinking, people are going to make those same assumptions about us. And the truth is, they might. People are people. And they will always make insensitive comments and ask stupid questions. Some of it's just thoughtless. Some of it's just pure um, naivety. And some of it's just crude and rude. And so understanding that people are going to be people and accepting that and then ultimately taking responsibility for how you feel and then subsequently what you say, that gives you control of the outcome as opposed to just thinking that because you feel bad about the question they just asked or the comment that they just made that somehow this is a bad situation and you have no control. You absolutely do have control because you're recognizing that that your old beliefs that people quit drinking because there's something wrong and that they fucked up, you're putting that into the conversation. It may, and most also it may not be there. You know, people just ask questions. You don't have to attach meaning to their inquiries. Um, the other thing is that we're forgetting that we have a lifetime of success in navigating social situations and protecting our own privacy. We do it all the time. It's just somehow in this context that it's feeling hard. But if you prepare and practice your responses to people and deal with your own emotions, then that is going to put you back in the driver's seat. So in this situation, in this module, you're going to make a plan so that you can work the plan and you're going to rinse and repeat. and It's going to be okay. Um, it's going to get better all the time. Uh, the other thing that's true, you know, we don't want to admit that we had a problem. And that's fair. But the truth is quitting drinking is the best decision you've ever made. You're glowing and you're more attractive in all ways, not just physically, but in all ways. You're listening better. You're interacting and connecting. You are, you're just you've leveled up and that shows. And so no matter how much you decide to downplay past problems, it's inevitable that people are noticing that you're doing better, which implies there was a worse. And so part of this is just accepting that people are going to recognize your success. And that's just a side effect of uh, self-improvement. So getting comfortable with that discomfort, um, you know, you can be uncomfortable with the fact that you sucked and you had a problem, or you can really focus on the improvement and the glory that you now feel in this new decision, the freedom and the authenticity. 
All right, so the next fear, number two, that we have about social situations is we're afraid of being judged or worse, pitied. Um, nobody wants to be pitied. So again, back to the belief that we had to quit drinking is probably um, feeding that fear. And ultimately, people quit drinking for a multitude of reasons. That's the truth. Intelligent people quit drinking because it feels better to not drink. Intelligent people quit drinking before their lives implode and they have legal and professional and marital issues. Um, you know, the only people who are still drinking and rousing other people who are not drinking are the, you know, high school jockstrap mentality where they think that, uh, or not that they think, that they haven't gotten the memo or they're not paying attention, or they're ignorant, or they're addicted to alcohol themselves. They haven't gotten the memo that alcohol causes cancer and stupidity and all of the other things that that can happen, including death, not to mention just a miserable life. They haven't gotten the memo and or they don't have the ability to change themselves. So, you know, understanding that the people who are judging you or pitying you deserve your pity is a, is a much more powerful way to turn that one on its head. Um, you know, we've quit alcohol ultimately because we are no longer willing to exchange our physical health, our emotional stability, and our mental sharpness and acuity in exchange for the acceptance of fellow addicts and people who aren't drinking. That's what we've been doing. So when you frame it like that, that, you know, if someone is judging you or pitying you, who is that person and why do you care? Ultimately, that is, is you know, you have to divorce yourself from the connection that you felt with drinkers because drinkers hang around with other drinkers because it normalizes their own behavior. Not even necessarily that they're awesome people. Some of them are. But for the most part, we just hang around with people who aren't going to question how many drinks we had. And so, you know, that's an uncomfortable separation when you realize that someone that you really like and still value their friendship, ultimately, um, the pity's on them, not you. Um, the other thing that, you know, afraid of being judged or pitied is that, you know, drinking hasn't been fun for a long time. Perhaps the pity goes to what you went through. Alcohol left you tired and disconnected and unmotivated. Um, you wasted so much time trying to manage, you know, the emotional, unpredictable emotions, regrettable behaviors, things you don't remember. That took a lot of time and effort. And you're sick of feeling sluggish and sick and pissed at yourself. So, you know, avoiding alcohol isn't about, you know, anything except the fact that you want to feel well. The other thing about feeling judged or pitied is, is in our society, we kind of um, view abstinence of alcohol with a vow of celibacy. You know, like, good luck with that. Why are you doing that? You're torturing yourself. But ultimately, alcohol, um, quitting alcohol isn't about abstinence. It's about intelligence. Sobriety is an indulgence. You know, it's the gift we give ourselves so that we can feel and look our best and level up mentally and in our relationships, you know, it's not about abstinence. It's, it's literally an indulgence. It's something most people don't know that they can easily give to themselves to just quit drinking. So, you know, a vow of sobriety is not the same as a vow of celibacy. And that is an underlying false belief. All right. Third belief is the fear of failure. What if you don't stick with this. And underlying that thought are the beliefs that first of all, quitting drinking is hard and painful, which as you're experiencing, it's not. But we've been, we've been brought up to believe that quitting is hard and painful. And really that belief comes from the fact that moderating is actually hard and painful. Managing an addiction is hard and painful. So somehow, if managing the addiction is hard, quitting the addiction is hard, that's a logical fallacy. Don't, and we need to stop making that leap. 
So our fear of failure um, around the beliefs that alcohol, quitting alcohol is hard are just unfounded. The other uh, belief that may be lingering underneath there is that somehow you're not capable of change. But the truth is you've changed lots of times. You've accomplished many things in your life. Think about how many times you've changed and just allow those, you know, the things that are coming to your head right now to reinforce the belief that, oh, 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 yeah, you for sure can change when you want to. Also, you've already changed. You've already discovered that you feel better and you know that this is exactly what you need. You've already made the change and you are quite vested at this point with Recovery University and all the other work you're doing. You're quite vested to unfuck your brain. So you already have made the change and you're just now continuing to reinforce it. You're continuing to maintain it. You know, you think about the processes of change that got us here, the pre-contemplation phase when we didn't even know we had a problem, the contemplation phase where we're bargaining and trying to make rules and trying to control ourselves and manage ourselves. That's pre-contemplation. Then the preparation phase, you know, where you're actively seeking support and help and putting things into place so that you can do this. Well, then you took action. You moved into action. This is the action phase, and that's quickly going to dovetail into the maintenance phase. So you have already changed. Um, so that fear somehow that you're not going to be able to stick with this, why the hell wouldn't you stick with this? You know, it feels awesome. It's quite rewarding on its own. So it's not hard. It's not like committing to, you know, run 15 miles every day where you are beating yourself up. Sobriety is unbeating yourself up. Sobriety is healing. Um, so framing it like that, not as a challenge, but as the easy button. Sobriety is the easy button um, and you've pressed it. So, you know, just continuing when you feel that fear of, will I be able to sustain this? Reminding yourself as to why that thought is illogical is really important. And, you know, the other thing is relying on a carcinogenic, neurotoxic and addictive drug just to feel normal, which also happens to require you to compromise all of your values and your potential, is absolutely not more desirable than freedom and autonomy and having healthy coping skills as you move through life. It's just not. So the fear that you're not going to want to sustain this, it's unfounded. All right, the next belief, number four, is that you have a reputation as a partier and that not drinking is a party foul and that somehow you're letting people down by not putting alcohol in your glass. And so there's a couple of beliefs there. First of all, that people are noticing or caring what's in your glass. Um, that's a little bit narcissistic. Um, in some cases, it may be true and, and we're gonna keep going, but most people, healthy people um, and fellow narcissists, not healthy people, don't care. Nobody cares. Nobody, you know, if you're carrying around a glass like this, which is what my glass used to look like all the time because vodka's clear and nobody would know I was drinking, nobody's looking in my glass now any more than they were then. They might have noticed, I might have slurred through some of those words, but ultimately nobody notices or cares what's in my glass. So drop that rock because nobody cares. Also, um, we somehow feel obligated to our fellow partiers, to our friends who are still drinkers, to somehow make them feel better about their own drinking by joining them. Because misery loves company, you know, their safety in numbers. Um, in truth, if someone can't enjoy themselves because you're not drinking, then they have their own emotional and mental health issues. And what they're looking is for you to enable them. They're looking for you to normalize their behavior. So that's not something that you need or want to engage in. Um, just recognizing the urge is, it, the urge is left over because you wanted that as a drinker. You know, your party would decrease if all of a sudden everybody around you stopped drinking because then either you had to stop drinking or turn on the blinking light alcoholic, alcoholic, alcoholic. So ultimately, again, that fear is from a past thought and past behaviors that you're now projecting into the current situation, which are no longer accurate. Um, you know, when 
if someone does notice that you're not drinking, if you feel happy and cool about the fact that you have a non-alcoholic beverage, healthy people aren't going to care. Those that do are jealous of your willpower. Not that we need willpower to not drink poison, but let's just go with that. They may think you have a lot of willpower, which just leveled you up in their eyes. They may be curious themselves about sobriety. And now in this situation may not be the time to talk about it, but ultimately curiosity may be motivating them to wonder why you're not drinking. And then the other option is that they're just total and complete assholes and they're projecting their shit onto you. So don't project your shit back into the situation. Let them own it. You know, everybody has to clean up their side of the street. The other thing with the uh, dr not drinking being a party foul is that somehow, you know, uh, breaking an addiction to alcohol has this stigma attached to it. In reality, we all understand you can get addicted to coffee, nicotine, sugar. You can even get addicted to exercise. You can get addicted to games, shopping, gambling, whatever. Ultimately, breaking an addiction to alcohol is pretty simple. And it's not, you know, that addiction is not an incurable disease. And so keeping, you know, in perspective that alcohol addiction is just another addiction and you've, you've broken it. That means that, you know, you're not a party foul. You're not, um, there's nothing wrong with you. Actually, there's something strong and right about you. Um, so finally, if a question or a comment about your sobriety tr does trigger that some shame or fear or unpleasant emotion, um, you know, first of all, recognizing that the call is coming from inside the house and it's not the comment, it's your thoughts and beliefs causing it. But also remembering that you now have a shit ton of new coping mechanisms to handle a blip on your emotional radar. I mean, you got this. It's not a big deal. So don't overthink if you do have a weird response. Um, don't overthink that and don't overthink whatever clueless comment they said. You know, just allow the blip, feel the blip, let the blip go away and move on. And finally, um, the fifth belief that we all have that creates anxiety about moving into social situations is that we don't know what to say. There are, there are questions and comments being made and we don't know what to say. And that's what this module is about because we're going to go through all of the options. But ultimately, uh, underlying the false belief is that, or the, the, the problem, underlying the problem is that we somehow think that we need a reason to say no. We, we know is not good enough. I don't want that is not good enough. Somehow we have to explain to people. And that is kind of our lot as, uh, you know, culture in this culture with women. We, we just somehow feel that we're obligated to explain, to nurture, to help, to support, and that our own needs somehow require, you know, a PhD dissertation and justification. They don't. No is a complete sentence. So when you don't know what to say, feel free to say nothing. You don't have to respond. Um, in our society, alcohol is the only drug we have to justify not using. Nobody's ever going to come up to you at a party and ask you why you don't want a bump of cocaine or why you aren't doing meth. Nobody's going to ask you those questions. People who are doing cocaine are hiding in the bathroom. Um, so it's just weird that somehow in our culture, it's socially acceptable to, you know, grill somebody who's not holding a beer. So recognizing that is really important and recognize your own responsibility, right? And responsibility to take care of yourself in all moments is key to moving through this. All right. So. Um, those are the five beliefs, and I encourage you to brainstorm any other hidden beliefs as you read through those again, the ones we just went through. Not only the false beliefs that may still be triggering emotions, but also the new truths that you've discovered, because I'm sure I didn't think of all of them. Then you're going to do some reflection on um, your identity, and you're going to look at your identity from the outside in. And the first thing I'm going to ask you is when you were drinking as a drinker, how did you want your drinking to be perceived? 
Did you want it? You know, probably, you know, I can pull things from movies. People who drink are reckless and not reckless. That's a negative word. Let's be real. People who are drinking are um, strong and, you know, they can drink their whiskey like a man. So somehow they can withstand pain. Uh, they're not susceptible to, you know, substances that make them tired or intoxicated. You know, they can drink and they can keep moving with their wits about them. Um, so that would be one thing, you know, but I ask you to break it down. How did you want your drinking to be perceived in your close relationships, you know, with your partner or um, other children, with your friends, close friends? How did you want your drinking? You know, because when you're holding a drink and everybody knows it, you're putting an image out there. So what did you think that image was in your community, professionally? What did you think about that? So that's going to be really cool to go through. You know, are you in an advertisement for red wine? You know, because if you're holding that drink, you are working as a customer service rep or, you know, you're working in advertising for big alcohol. So what were you advertising? What did you think that message conveyed about, you know, the drink in your hand? What did you think that meant? And then a little more painful of a question is how do you think you actually were perceived by your partner, by your children, friends, community, and professionally? And you, you don't need to necessarily dig into really deep, you know, damage that you've done, but just keep it surface. You know, what do you think people think about you knowing that you were a drinker? What, what's their opinion? You know, keep it to a few sentences or less. Um, yeah. And, and that'll be really eye opening. And then um, I ask you, how do you want to feel? as a non-drinker. So not how you want to be perceived, although there's room for that question. But, you know, if you thought about somebody who's a non-drinker and who's a badass, um, you know, a sober celebrity or somebody who's written some of these great books, what do you think that they feel about themselves and how can you internalize that? You know, are you thinking that about yourself? Um, and finally, I have a really fun little exercise I ask you the question, what do you, what do you want people to think about the fact that you're not drinking and list some comments that you'd like to overhear, you know, so imagine yourself in the bathroom stall and two women are talking, um, or, you know, you, you come across a group of people at work and they're talking about you. What are they saying? What would you like to hear? That's a, that's a fun one. Um, okay, and then moving on, we're going to move into prepare and practice. And I come up with all the questions and comments that I've ever faced and that I can think of. And I want you to brainstorm your response. So what can I get you to drink? What do you say to that? You know, um, I know sometimes because we associate the word drink with alcohol, then you might be feeling like you should say, well, I don't drink. When, as I've shared before, if somebody asks me what to drink, I just tell them, you know, I just give them my order. I'll have that LaCroix. I'll have a hops water. Um, I'll have water with lemon, you know, whatever it is that I want to drink. I just answer the question what I want to drink. And I don't misperceive the word drink as a reference to alcohol, even if it is. Um, that's the fun part too. When people look at you like, oh, you can order a, a water in a bar. Yeah, you can. They have it. Um, another couple of questions, you know, what are you going to say if somebody says, let's meet and discuss this over drinks? Well, just think about it, you know, prepare your response. Why aren't you drinking? You know, come up with something like that. Um, how long are you going to do this? That's a good one. What are you going to say? Um, and then I ask you to come up with any other questions and comments that you might be able to anticipate or that you've received and then to think about how you respond. And then I encourage you to practice. That may sound silly, but thinking, 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 you know, no actor rehearses their lines by just reading. You have to speak them. And so speaking in front of the mirror, uh, practicing on your dog, having a close friend, you know, run through, literally run through your lines, practice them. Um, and then, you know, start carting them out with random strangers, you know, practice in a restaurant, you know, the waitress asks you want to drink, go ahead and 
and say your two or three lines. I mean, she's kind of obligated to stand there and listen. So just practice. Um, or, you know, people at the grocery store sitting at, sitting at, in a waiting room, you know, just look for opportunities to practice. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to practice after you create it is I have you write an elevator speech. An elevator speech is simply a, a quick communication that presents a desired message that's well thought out that you could deliver to somebody in the time it takes to ride the elevator with them. And elevator speeches are most applicable. Perhaps you've used them in business. You know, if you're in sales um, or some other sort of profession, you know, when someone asks you a question, you need to be prepared with a response. And so writing an elevator speech to answer the question of why you've chosen to become a non-drinker is really useful um, because it gives you a chance to pull out the highlights, not stammer. And again, you can practice, you can practice that and it's really powerful. And then finally, um, I, I have you look at social plans and I've come up with four key things before you go into any social situation, especially one that you're concerned about, um, is that you, that you have four, 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 four thoughts, four factors. Number one, identify your objective for attending. So what is the purpose of the event? Why are you going to the event? What do you need to achieve and what do you want to achieve? And this just helps you give a really, you know, objective view as to the purpose. And in early sobriety, sometimes you may look at the objective and decide, I don't need to go. I'm not ready for this. And that's really important. If you do need to go, then you need to objective, then you need to identify why you need to go so that you can be sure to meet those objectives and get the hell out whenever you need to. So number one is identify your objective. Number two is to plan your approach. And this is key. Now is not the time for you to say to all your drunk buddies that you don't drink anymore and you can now be a designated driver. That is the opposite of self-care. So driving separately, especially if your partner still drinks and will be drinking, um, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're stuck and at the mercy of people who are now intoxicated and have zero fucks to give for your needs. So driving separately is a really great strategy. And if the spouse or your friends um, need a ride, they can call Uber because if you were drinking, they'd still have the same dilemma. It is not your responsibility to decide how other people are getting home. Um, it's your responsibility to take care of yourself. Um, the other thing with planning your approach is, do you want to bring your own beverage? Usually you do. If you're going to a dinner party, you'd probably bring a bottle of wine anyway. So don't be rude and show up with nothing um, because you're sober now. Bring, you know, uh, the sparkling waters or, you know, they have so many wonderful, they have non-alcoholic wines. They have non-alcoholic beers. They have, you know, all sorts of juices and sparkling juices that are wonderful. So show up and bring something. Um, but most importantly, it's not necessarily to contribute, although people will drink your shit, so bring more than you need. But it's to have to make sure that when glasses are being filled, you've got something to put in your own glass, bring your own beverage. Also, uh, plan your approach. You need to think about, would it be helpful to have any preemptive conversations? You know, if you just quit drinking a week ago and you haven't seen all your buddies and you have a girl's night out or, you know, some sort of uh, professional situation, would it be helpful? I don't know, but would it be helpful to have a preemptive conversation? Hey, just to let you know I'm not drinking, fill in why. Um, so that when you show up, your anxiety. It's all about dialing down your own anxiety. So these questions are designed, there's no right or wrong. They're designed to, to help you feel better about going into a situation that's your first time. It's just preparing. Um, you want to preemptively think about anything that might make you uncomfortable and how you might handle it, um, whatever that may be. Also, do you or can you enlist support? Is there anybody there that you want to touch base with and say, hey, you know, it's my first non-drinking party. Woo! Do you want to hold my hand or do you want to make eye contact with me? Um, you know, do you want to be my buddy? Um, or can I call you if I get into trouble? Um, just enlisting support 
is really important. You deserve support. You know, as a drinker suffering with alcohol use disorder, you got real isolated and you didn't ask for help. And this is the joy of recovery is recognizing that asking for help is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. So if you need some support and you can get it, go for it, ask for it. Um, it's good. All right, number three, we've already gone over some of it, but number three is to practice your response. Know your lines. Just like an actor going into a first run of a show doesn't show up without never having made his vocal cords activated, don't show up at a party never having practiced the words that you know you're gonna have to speak. Um, so have your elevator speech ready. Go through all those questions I gave you. Also, um, in practicing your response, you may not be ready to give your elevator speech and that's fine. So practice your cover story. What is it? You know, is it, you're not drinking because you're on medication. Uh, you're on a cleanse. You got a big day tomorrow, you know, just think ahead. Uh, so that if you are telling a story, your story is consistent. That's all. And then finally with practice your response, um, especially in dealing with uh, family, uh, what boundaries will you need to set? Um, and how will you enforce them? You know, there is a module on boundaries and that's a whole big thing. But, you know, if somebody's, you know, somebody's going to be obnoxious and you know, somebody's going to be trying to push your buttons, you know, deciding what your boundary is, stating your boundary, and then deciding what the consequences of them violating your boundary is really important and a huge act of self-care. And then finally, number four is you need an exit strategy for sure. Again, driving yourself is, is, is the ideal if you can do it. Um, then if you can't leave, so, you know, this may not apply, you know, this may apply to after work drinks for an hour and it may apply to weekends away with groups of people. So this is, you know, my advice here is trying to cover the whole, the whole gamut. But if you aren't going to be able to leave, how will you prepare for a timeout? Plan on needing a timeout because you will. Um, and then, you know, when you take a timeout, will you need to have somebody that you want to talk to that you can call? Do you want to bring a book? Do you have your headphones? Do you need to bring walking shoes, your journal, whatever else it is? Um, you know, your exit strategy, it may not be actually leaving. It may just be a timeout, but plan on timeouts and how you're going to fill them in a way that renews your, uh, you know, just like charging your phone, renews your sense of confidence and peace and all of that. Um, and then finally, decide in advance when you intend to leave or what's going to trigger your leaving. Is it a certain amount of time? Uh, is, it be, is it when you feel a certain level of anxiety? You know, so on a scale of one to 10, if your anxiety hits a five, is that like, okay, I gotta go because I don't wanna stress myself out um, even more and put myself in either a situation where I might relapse or just a situation where ugh, I'm not having fun and my new commitment to self-care is that I'm always taking care of myself. So um, will you leave after a certain amount of time uh, when you have a certain level of anxiety or once you've achieved your objective, thinking back to why you're there, you know, as drinkers, we're not used to setting plans and making plans. You know, once the booze gets poured, we're kind of unpredictable. So, you know, I'm showing up at a party with my drink and saying, oh, I'm only staying for an hour. Everybody knows that's bullshit. Everybody knows that. Um, if there's alcohol involved, if you're not drinking, you're much more likely to stick by your resolve. So make a plan in advance and have an exit strategy. All right. And that's it for social sobriety. So let me know, um, if you want to dial through any thoughts or need any specific feedback, uh, but I hope this helps. Good luck.